Well, I don't want to talk today too much about the need to get ourselves into shape, other than to put it into a perspective, and a perspective that will put a lot of burden on our organizations, not just to talk about the things we talk about, but to really change the way we act. The crisis we have today is a crisis that is not only for the first time a global crisis, it affects each and every one of us. The crisis has three elements. Yes, it's the financial economic crisis. And we played roulette and we lost. And we have to pay for it. So on the financial construct that we have, we had for the last 25 years, we need to go back to the drawing board. And it was clear, very, very clear, that we couldn't do that with the leadership that we had in place in the world up until a year ago. Do you remember those pictures of the G8? And for those of you who are historians, you know that those were the guys who were the winners of World War II. So in a way, World War II ended in Pittsburgh three weeks ago. When the transfer was from the G8 to the G20. And the G20 just reflects the reality of the world today, which means the power is more evenly spread and the economic capability of people around the world has changed fundamentally. And I think it's a good thing. It will mean fairer, opener, more competition. It will mean that where you are located is no longer going to be the driving force for whether you're successful or not. But we have to realize that it will have a downside. Where somebody win, somebody else will lose, unless we lift the total. The second crisis is the climate change crisis. And we hope that it will go away in the knowledge that it won't. Whether Copenhagen will be an immediate success or not, we will get, without any shadow of a doubt, to tasks, to targets, for us as a global family to substantially reduce CO2 emission. So we have to fundamentally rethink the way we give incentives to achieve the 2050 target that we will agree upon. And it has to be a global deal. For your own organization, you better buy yourself a big mirror and look in the mirror and say, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for the way that we produce? What does this mean for the way we add value? And how can we ensure that this is not seen as a burden, but as an opportunity to get out of the crisis we're in? And then comes the third crisis, probably the most difficult one, a crisis of confidence. We have shaken the world to the extent that everybody who claims to be an expert is in bad shape today. Experts are no longer believed. People in positions to know, in positions to lead, are under suspicion. There is no confidence coming back unless leadership takes accountability, is willing to be transparent, and is willing to confront the anger of society in a face-to-face -face meeting. Yeah, that's what we need to do. I want to come back to uh, where you ended your remarks. And you said something that I think uh, many people uh, in this room would agree with, which is that, uh, and we, you referenced our slide, getting, getting our CEOs more engaged, building this leadership commitment at the top. Uh, I know uh, one of the, the primary questions in the minds of a lot of people here is, yep, got it, couldn't agree more. How do we go about doing that? All right. So, so we want your tricks. How do we do this? So the best trick is this. Don't tell them that I told you. <laughs> the best trick is this. Without any shadow of a doubt, in three to five years, we will have mandatory reporting on issues like climate change and sustainability in the same way we have financial mandatory reporting. So if I were you, I would go back to your CEO and say, we went to a great conference. The thing that is very important for you to know is that there will be mandatory 
transparent reporting, not in the marketing sense of the word, we are a bra bra type of um, report. No, we have to go and have reporting based on standards that are internationally verified. And that means that we as an organization better prepare, otherwise three years from now, you will find that you are in a position you don't want to be in. What do you think are some of the highest and best roles for business in this global dialogue, in making the deal work, in influencing these mechanisms? So the first thing business is trying to do is get their act together. I remember that I was asked to chair the, uh, the climate change board in the, in the UK at the time at BT. And when we started, we had 18 chairman and CEO around the table, companies like Shell Oil and BP and, you know, 1% of world uh, CO2 emission was sitting around the table, and most were sitting like this, like saying, I'm sitting here to ensure that we do absolutely nothing. And after a while, when you thought, okay, what are all the alternatives? What does government have as tool sets? Well, government has only two things, regulation and taxation. Is that what you want? Really not. So what, have we, what do we have? Well, we have technology, we have customers, we have capabilities to execute. So isn't it better to do it yourself than getting things done by others in a way that you really don't want to? And that's what changed the mood of that, of that particular group. Now, the group came out with a, a self-imposed set of criteria uh, in which we are now in the phase of executing, which is far beyond what the government as a task would have given to us. So it's possible, but what you need is the passion of leadership to go and do it. There's one thing I reminded all the chairman and CEOs of in the first meeting. I said, read your own job description. Your job description is to be unreasonable and be very good at that. So let's be unreasonable on ourselves and be very good at it. And I think that is the task at hand.